Greetings, future fossils. Michael Garfield here, welcoming you to another episode of the podcast that explores our place in time. And even though I recorded this particular episode with the fabulous Daniel Zen a couple months ago, it seems especially appropriate to release it now in wake of Ja Rule's Fire Festival disaster. In fact, we spent a good deal of this conversation discussing the intersection of technology and festivals, and specifically how festival culture provides this unique test bed for the exploration and discovery of disaster relief, as well as the moral concerns of the deepening divide between the rich and the poor. So this surreal news item bringing high technology, class warfare, refugees, and social media seems very timely, especially in light of this unusually prescient discussion on the relationship between telecommunications technologies, our architecture and infrastructure, and the way that we understand self and culture online. But before we dive into a conversation exploring the many angles on surveillance, virtual reality, the singularity, and the worldwide explosion of festival culture, this podcast is entirely listener-supported by the friends at patreon.com slash Michael Garfield, where this is one of several different related projects, including a book as well as music that I recently and delightfully discovered was used in the phase two clinical trials for treating PTSD with MDMA. So if you like what's going on here, then please consider making a small monthly donation, $2, $5, whatever. Super special thanks to Eric and Named Twice, this podcast's latest Patreon supporters. It means a lot to me to know that even though this show is rhetorically recorded for the unborn digital archaeologists exploring the initiatory spark of our future civilization, that there are in fact living human beings who enjoy and appreciate this. So thanks again. If you can't support on Patreon, that's fine. I'm grateful that you're listening, and there are other ways that you can help. For example, subscribing, rating, and reviewing on iTunes or Stitcher or Google Play. And of course, it's always great to hear that someone discovered the podcast from a friend, so consider passing it on to someone you think will appreciate it. We have a number of amazing episodes coming up. I just got back from the MAPS Psychedelic Science Conference in Oakland and captured some great conversations there. But for now, I am delighted to share this conversation with former Google coder, Burning Man, NYC regional coordinator, technology instructor, and generally interesting person, Daniel Zen. Okay, well, welcome on board, everyone. I'm here with creative internet wizard. Daniel Zen. And uh, we actually is another one of those circumstances where the pre-call conversation got so interesting that I just said, "Eh, we got to like stop right now and start recording because we're already in the thick of it. So let's talk about what the link that you just sent me. I get a little bit of uh, pretext, I guess, would be that Daniel and I met through my participation in the Google Glass Explorer program in 2013 when he was consulting for Google. And uh, some of our first conversations were conversations about the emancipatory promise and social control peril of this increasingly accessible and ubiquitous surveillance technology. So uh, why don't yeah why don't you take it from here and, and talk a little bit about this news that you just shared with me and and your your stance on it? I'm. Uh, you know, my stance on it is still in question, but I guess the news that I was quoting uh, or sent the link to was how New York City is proposing um, tracking license plates and and using facial recognition on all people entering and leaving New York City. 
in an effort to know who's who's there and who's not there. Although I, I imagine if they start now, there'll be a few people, hermits, that they'll never know or even exist inside the city because if they don't move around enough, they won't see them. <laughs> so I know that neither of us is the knee-jerk reaction type of person when it comes to news like this, that there are definitely, you know, both of us have spent enough time puzzling over the the benefits and the hazards of this stuff that maybe I'll speak for myself. I feel like I spend a considerable amount of time assuring people that this is as good as it is bad. <laughs> but I don't know other than just huh. Yeah, I, I mean what does it seem to you this seems to me like you know where New York leads there the rest of the country follows and this is just a particularly in our face example of a a trend that's been going on for as long as we've had the ability to spy on one another, which is that every camera creates a new blind spot. And so it's this like runaway process that's really nothing new. It's been going on for centuries, but it's gotten really fast lately. Well, you know, things are exponential, right? Right. So, I mean, where do you, I mean, do you, do you ultimately look upon this kind of stuff, I mean, clearly we have to change the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we relate to one another, but not not just in a sense of trying to escape the camera, because that seems kind of counterproductive in a sense. Like, I mean, part, so, some part of me wants to find the joyous participation in the whole resistance is futile angle on this. You know, to really embrace this the way that like certain people like science fiction author David Brin have embraced surveillance and said, hey, look, this actually makes us more accountable to one another, at least in theory. Yeah, uh, I mean, well, I mean, working backwards, you know, Uber recently said that they would be tracking people uh, as they got in out of the Uber cars and would keep track of them for up to five minutes afterwards. So Uber now will know that when you took that cab to your lawyer's office, you were actually visiting, you know, the prostitute or the massage parlor next door. They'll have that information, you know, and, and then in some cases, having that information in private hands might be useful for what it is they wish to do for you, which is service you better. On the other hand, once that information gets purchased by, you know, because it's all capitalism says, oh, you have that data. Can I buy a copy of that data for you? And in fact, a lot of government data comes because they purchase it from private sources. So in, in some ways, the government could just say, hey, Uber, we want access to that same information. Let's cross-reference it with the facial recognition and the license plates to make our model you know, even cleaner. And so am I against surveillance in general? No, but my biggest problem is the unevenness of it all. Uh, the fact that there are certain people in power that can take advantage of this information, and then the you know random people who wish to hold people accountable, like you say, they don't have access to the information, so it's hard to hold people accountable if the information is not available to you. So if I'm someone that cares about um, what my representatives are doing and I wish to track them, I can't. But yet, if some Somebody in power says, hey, we're curious about somebody. We've you know, decided to flag them for whatever reasons. And now we're watching every single place they go in an effort to find um, some pattern that says there's an issue or a problem that we can bring up and use for to, to perhaps uh, use greater surveillance for perhaps have a you know, tap their phone line or, or something. So I think that the problem is who has the power to see this information is the biggest problem. Totally. I, I don't think most people are even aware of uh, these other forms of valence that you know, there's not just surveillance, which is to view from above, but also surveillance to view from below and covalence to view at eye level. And so you get into these things like I remember John Perry Barlow uh, was giving a talk at a festival a few years ago at Rootwire Festival, and he was speaking on he, he rubs a lot of elbows for a guy that wrote lyrics for the Grateful Dead. It's kind of amazing how cozy he is with like the NSA and the CIA and these other organizations. And he was saying that. His... Well, he's one of the founders of the EFF. So that kind of puts him in the right company. Right. And it's amazing how all of these these people on the other side of this supposed fence really 
there seems to be real great mutual respect, at least in, in sort of a like a sporting kind of chess match kind of a sense. They really seem to appreciate it. And his whole case was, look, I, I don't mind my life being completely transparent because I grew up on a cattle ranch in a small town in Wyoming where everybody knew everybody else's business. And so for me, this is actually nothing new. The only difference is that everybody knew everybody else's business. And as long as I know what they know about me and maybe even know something about them, then we're good. And it's, it's only when those disparities in information access become an issue that transparency ceases to be a force for mutual accountability and becomes instead the, the breeding place of you know, secret power agendas and that kind of thing. I don't know. I mean, that's, that's what it seems like to me. So the question then becomes, is the technology that we use slanted towards these in, imbalances in power or can we can we use what we already have to tilt the, you know is it is it really living up to its promise the internet as this force for you know new forms of fluid and decentralized social organization you know i'm thinking about the um how people they they request the information that the government has to be open i think you can you can make uh what's the standard american process for uh it was a Freedom there. of Information Act solicitation, I think. I think that's, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and usually the, the issue with a lot of that is it's always delayed. So in other words, you know, you might be able to petition for freedom of information, but it's a process. And the question is, at what point will you say, okay, this information that we're gathering needs to be accessible by everyone instantaneously? And and that's, you know, it's the, P, I, I think there was a quote, I think I just watched uh, The Young Pope on HBO. And one of them, one of them quoted and said, you know, you know where power comes from having the information first mm. was one of the quotes. And, it, and so it's not so much having information, but having it first and knowing things ahead of everybody else. And that's where the power lies. So do you think in that, in, in line with that, do you think that, uh, you know, organizations like Singularity University, for example, encourage people to design for for technological ecosystems that don't even exist yet that aren't going to exist for another two to five years so that they're designing into the future that so that they can kind of catch it as it lands and it seems like the i remember the first time i read something uh a few years ago an article about google where i don't remember if it was sergey brin or somebody said that they're ultimate goal was to answer the question before you are even aware that you have a question. So it seems like we're our our uh, urgency to get that first mover advantage is we're taking it so far that it's it's now beyond simply responding to the information that you've just received but sort of anticipating the information you will receive. And that gets into some really sticky stuff. I don't know. Yeah, especially because it's like, oh, I'm predicting that you're hungry because it's lunch hour, and therefore I'm sending you an ad for a nearby food venue. <laughs> you know, so there's a little bit of that too. It's like I know you're going to need information on how to take care of something, but I'm going to then, you know, push you towards my solution for how to take care of that. And that's also what happens. But but I think. You probably read that quote right around when Google Now was coming out because that was the goal of Google Now was was to be able to say, hey, you know, we're going to give you information on your upcoming commute because we know it's commute time and we can predict the traffic or we know the traffic uh, between, you know, where you work and where you live. Yeah. And so, I mean, th that kind of thing sounds reasonable. And then, I, you know, a few years ago, I remember back when they still had Google Latitude where it was just this, you know, share your location with your friends. And that's still available inside of Google+. Plus. Oh, good. Okay. I thought they'd totally scuttled it. but No, they moved it into Google+. Plus. They're, they're, I, I still use that feature. I used to use Latitude, and I had to move, when they, they moved that functionality into Plus. Huh. Well, I, you know, it seems like I've changed my tune about that, that one in particular, because that one actually does seem like a service, whereas before... It's funny, I think, you know, you and I are in the, the last group of people that remembers how long it took to download pornography in the 1990s, you know, <laughs> and this, this sense of living. I was just reading a New York Magazine article about this, about how different 
human sexuality, for example, was then versus what it is now to come awake to your own sexuality as an adolescent, because the availability and the openness of it has has com changed completely that it was this thing that was puzzled through in isolation once upon a time and you didn't have so much access to the you know the outside of someone else's inside as it were you know the vicarious sexual education and likewise with latitude it seemed like i had to go through an adjustment between believing that no one should know where i am privacy as an ideal and then realizing that actually if i'm i want my friends to know where i am i mean if google already knows and all i'm doing is granting my friends permission to have that same information and that like this is the thing that you get into like prostitutes that that team up and will always let one another know which hotel room they're working and that kind of thing just in case it's a buddy system it's some, it seems like sometime in the last 500 years, our priority on the individual has eroded our native understanding of the buddy system. You know, when I first studied surveillance in society, which is a while ago now, I remember that we were talking about whether or not it was immoral or the ethics of tracking your child. You know, and nowadays, I don't think anybody would even think twice about putting a GPS tracker on their child. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly like that. But I mean, there's this, there's this sort of chunky issue. But the reason that this stuff fascinates me is because it seems like it's, it's part of this conversation, this wider conversation around the way that technology is soliciting from the human organism, a kind of psychological evolution or adjustment we're not just changing the way that our lives look around us we're changing the way that they feel we're changing the way that we understand who we are as people with respect to one another so you know you work in a lot of spaces where empowerment and psychological transformation in a sort of more spiritual sense is contextualized by event production and entertainment technology and i'm curious where you see the intersection of those two things, that there's this, this sort of ambient pressure from an accelerating society on the one hand, and then on the other hand, we have this seemingly also accelerating interest in coming together in liminal spaces and in ecstatic ways. I mean, you're a New York Burning Man representative. You put festivals and intentional events together. So, I mean, where do these two wings of your life actually intersect? Well, that's such a great question for me because I've always had difficulty really bringing those, you know, so I've, I've done a lot of performance and technology and event production. And I mean, performance and, and event production, I kind of know where those two go together. But the technology, you know, I, I get paid by corporations to do training and to develop, you know, apps and websites and whatever. And I haven't really brought that to bear as much. I've been trying hard, having worked on interactive installations, I've been trying harder to bring it to bear there. But to answer your question about where, you know, there, there's some interesting lines that I'll just, you know, I'll speak more loosely about instead of having specific implementations. So for instance, you know, the, the festival world has changed over time as now everybody has a cell phone and the ability to take pictures. So uh, very much, I believe, and the community I'm in believes in consent when it comes to photography, uh, especially when people are in, you know, maybe a greater state of undress, not necessarily naked, but more revealing clothing at certain festivals that they don't necessarily want to be published um, and tagged in, in particular, on Facebook if, if maybe that'll come back to their work life. You know, this is something that they're doing in their off time, and they don't necessarily want that version of them to be represented, let's say, on LinkedIn. <laughs> so that's been an issue in and of itself. Um, and nowadays, you know, it's so much harder to prevent images from being taken. Uh, but I remember getting up upset at people who were, I don't know, let's say, engaging in light, you know, bondage in public at Burning Man. And, you know, so definitely on display. Definitely, you know, purposely wanting to be uh, have people look at them. 
but at the same time, not necessarily requesting them to themselves to be photographed. And I would get upset at people who would walk up with a camera as though they had the right to take a picture. Who am I? I mean, I'm just someone that knows the festival culture, and that's why I was upset about this. I mean, that's part of what yeah. brought me to become the regional rep is having this sort of feeling like they're allowed to do that, but that doesn't mean you're allowed to take the picture without asking. So, you know, now we're in a world where surveillance is much more prevalent. And I think about festivals that might hand out, you know, NFC badges that as you walk into different um different areas of the the festival, maybe they'll even make note of which area you're in and perhaps even share that information. Because if you're in a festival of, let's say, 3,000 people, it might be a useful service to the people at the festival to know which pavilion you're in or which stage you're at. And so I could see that actually becoming a useful feature and saying, hey, wear this, you know, here's your bracelet. It's also your ticket. And it'll allow others who are trying to find you to know, hey, you're at this stage of that pavilion. Now, Maybe that's a negative if your ex-girlfriend's there and you're trying to avoid them or something. But in general, I could see the advantage of, I mean, how many times, I mean, you've been to Burning Man, how many times you've been there and tried to like search out somebody and been like, I have no idea where they are. This is a city. I couldn't possibly guess where they are, you know, and so you can't find your friends. And I'm a believer in bringing offline technology to Burning Man. I don't like the concept of being online at Burning Man, but I do like the concept of technology at Burning Man. I would love to see, and I've talked about this for years, and that doesn't mean I've implemented it, I'd love to see an intranet at Burning Man where people at Burning Man could communicate with other people at Burning Man and send images and chats and whatever with people on site, but without any connection to the outside world. And in fact, such a system might, if, if it could be implemented well, would be useful in disaster situations because uh, the big problem with our current in internet infrastructure is it's based on a centralized system where everything has to go to the center before coming back out to each person. If we could create a system that could like lay down a net in a random area in the desert, then we could do the same thing at Katrina in a disaster situation. Or after some other sort of, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but like a terrorist attack, you'd be able to quickly implement a communication infrastructure without having to rely on the, the, the centralized one that could possibly break down. That's actually my my experience of some of the more interesting experiments at Burning Man have been prototyping disaster relief technologies right. exactly. within the festival environment. And in a way... That seems really apropos because, you know, our mutual friend Mitch Mignano wrote his graduate work on Burning Man as a sort of prophetic foreshadowing of the, the kind of cities that we're going to have once the Internet has finally matured, which is, you know, to say that the original uh, cacophony society of the zone trip as an outgrowth of their various pranks in San Francisco, they saw the city as a playground. And so there's this, there's this sense where that vision of the city as a festival converges with uh, his graduate advisor, William Irwin Thompson's idea, seemingly correct, that we're moving into a century of constant disruption, constant terrorism, paranoia, and climate change, and that it's a time of extraordinary instability. So we have to adjust our civic infrastructure in a way that makes our cities themselves more dynamic, more fluid, perhaps more ephemeral. You know, something that we can, if the seawater rises, we want the city to rise with it. You know, so there's this, this sense in which the... It seems like, especially in the cases that you're giving here, the city and the festival, and perhaps also the protest, like the mesh networks that were uh, tested in Occupy, in like right. Occupy Washington, that there was this sense in which we're all, from every different angle, we're looking for new ways to imagine and implement these strategies for bringing people together, for assembling them at a moment's notice in, in beneficial ways. Yeah, and actually the moment's notice is definitely the emphasis there. I mean, the, the great thing about Burning Man is how quickly it comes together now. Um, you know, perhaps it's an exaggeration because there's a lot of work that goes in from the DPW crew that sets up a lot of infrastructure before anybody else even shows up. Um, but the concept that you can quickly put together a city and then dismantle it afterwards, um, <laughs> 
you know, goes to show you that you can set up and dismantle infrastructure. And I'm sure, you know, the, this is the same type of technology that the army uses to move in onto a new location and set up a base camp. You know, it's it's the, these these are the same technologies that allow you in a disaster situation to go in and set up a base camp in order to support, um, you know, people in need. Mm. Yeah. So uh, in light of that, it seems like, you know, some of the issues that I remember with the Occupy Movement mesh networks is that those networks were actually rolled out, like given to the protesters by members of, I think it was DARPA. Like it was a defense research project that was being deployed experimentally in a convenient situation where it would be useful to people. But we're at that point now with the same is true for like hacking somebody's pacemaker, where even as we rely on these new technologies to address some of the sort of chronic human insecurities of not being able to find one another and organize effectively, it's at the same time, it's getting us you know, back to this original conversation about monitoring everyone who enters and exits New York City, you put your pacemaker online and suddenly your pulse can be hacked. And, yeah. so, you know, we get into this thing of like, we're using oh, the be, master's not tools. Be hacked, it can become part of a botnet to attack somebody else, which, <laughs> is, which is what happened recently with the DNS service. No kidding. Same yeah, well, not that. pacemakers in particular. It was all the light switches mostly and the cameras, actually. I think. I mean, not not to say anything negative about particular companies, but I think D-Link is one of the uh, most hackable, you know, systems on the Internet. And supposedly um, there are a lot of um, routers out there that they were able to bypass the routers to get to the individual items inside of, you know, people's homes, the cameras and the, the, the light switches that are all online and running some sort of firmware. And then they were able to hack them to at a pre- uh, determined time or rather at, at, you know, when they were told to then all attack the DNS servers at the same time. And so there was, I don't remember what day it was, but it was a couple of months ago that there were certain services that were down on the internet. And I was like, oh my God, the internet's been hacked. And in a matter of speaking, it had. There were, for several hours, there were services that were not available because the DNS servers, the main DNS servers were down for a lot of corporations. It wasn't just Kim Kardashian's new beach photo that broke the internet? No. <laughs> no, it was actually somebody had arranged for a network of bots that had all been hacked, not necessarily pacemakers, that's that's exactly, but a lot of um, internet cameras and light, light bulbs and, you know, internet of things, basically. Mm. They had been pre-programmed to, at a certain time, all start sending traffic to these DNS servers and over, basically it's a denial of service attack. So since they're all doing it at the same time, it floods the DNS in such a way that it can't do its job because it's too busy responding to bogus requests. Ah, I actually compared when I was writing about Google Glass around the time that I met you, it seemed like this, this has a clear correlate in the natural world, quote unquote, in, you know, evolutionary precedent in zebra striping, which is essentially you put a herd of zebras together. An individual zebra has no camouflage, but when you put a herd of them together, the moving stripes exert such an extraordinary demand on the visual cortex of a predator that it's effectively a biological denial of service attack. And that this has actually been going on for some time that there's I forget who it was that had a TED talk seven years ago or so about how he'd ended up on the, the federal watch list for flying and kept getting detained because he had the same name as some wanted terrorist. Right. Oh, I was actually going to mention that guy earlier. He started giving away his location at all times. Right. He would right. publish his location because he was sick and tired of them tracking him. He's like, you want to know where I am? Look at this website. <laughs> yeah. And he, the, the whole the beauty of it was they didn't know what to do with all of the information. They couldn't handle that. Although now it seems that using artificial intelligence to uh, filter that enormous glut of surveillance data may sort of help with that, may sort of... Yeah, no, we, we've got big data and prediction analytics. We, we're, we're starting to see the ability to analyze large data. And so we're going to be able to be able to pick the needle out of the haystack sooner sooner than we think. And that's, that's unfortunate because right now it is a glut. But over time, there's, there's something that needs to be done. There's something called um, 
like cleansing the data. It has to be in the right format. But once we start to put some AI to work to try and like pull out the information in the right format, then we'll be able to analyze it. And I mean, it's maybe not today, but within a few years, that's going to become a lot easier. I hold out hope that when it really does get to that point and we really do have all of our cards on the table in front of everyone, like the way that people play poker when you can see someone else's hand is mm-hmm. fundamentally different. There's no body shame in a nudist colony. Like I'm holding out hope that even if it's a, it's a generational shift and it takes 30 to 50 years to really take hold, that we're going to have a much healthier relationship living in public in a few decades than we do today for because there won't be a way to escape it but then again you got people like the dark wallet guys here in austin who are dedicated villains who really believe that encryption is the best strategy to defend personal liberty and so when edward snowden suggests that the reason that we can't find aliens in the cosmos is because a sufficiently advanced civilization encrypts everything so that it looks like radio noise from a distance. I don't really know which version of the future is better, one in which we can keep our secrets or one in which we can't. Hmm. Well, once again, I mean, the the real question is whether or not the information will be evenly distributed. I think um, I, I read a quote saying the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Ah, but William Gibson. Yeah. William Gibson. So the problem is that data is the same thing. If the data is not evenly distributed, then those that have access to the information are going to be the ones with the power. All these corporations are collecting data, but they're not sharing it. So it's probably unprofessional for me to ask you as someone who consults for Fortune 500 companies, if you think that we have sort of a, a moral imperative to take our data back somehow. Well, I mean, this has always been the argument, you know, in Europe versus America when it comes to privacy rights. You know, America has played like very loose with privacy information. It's we've let all the corporations gather all the information in Europe. There are a lot of laws that say, you know, you're not allowed to gather that information without. And even then we give it up. Even if we were asked, hey, do you mind giving up? Like, well, if it's going to I want Google to know where I am so that when I ask it, where's the nearest pizza parlor, it can tell me. It doesn't know where I am. It's not going to be able to tell me where the nearest one is. I remember, you know, too long ago, before the GPS was in my phone, I had a what I call a moderately intelligent phone, not a smartphone. <laughs> so I had a, a Palm, um, a Trio, and I had a, an app back then called Vindigo. So for any of the old timers that are listening to this, and Vindigo basically allowed you to download the latest restaurant and movie times and uh, bar information into your phone. Now, it didn't have a GPS. So if I wanted to ask it, hey, where's there a nearby bar? Where's there a nearby like movie playing? I had to tell it where I was each and every time. Nowadays, now that my phone has GPS, I have all the same technology. I don't have to have a local copy of the database because I'm online. And uh, I, I simply, you know, it knows where I am and it, and it finds the data in real time. So that's a big shift. So I'm giving up my location for convenience. And unfortunately, we are a society that enjoys convenience and we're all too ready to give up our privacy for that convenience. I mean, I don't know that that's necessarily a bad thing. Again, like we've we've just, we've been discussing here, it's like so many other changes, it necessitates adjustment, but it also yields sort of potentials on both sides. I'm kind of more interested in taking a step back at this point to ask you, what's really lighting you up right now in terms of new technologies that as someone who's as deep in this game as you are, you probably have a first mover advantage with respect to to me and most of the audience. Oh, I, I, but I've watched so many technologies go by going, I knew that was going to happen and I just watched it go by. You know, the joke, there's those that make things happen. There's those that watch things happen. And there's those that go, what happened? Uh, so you're a watcher? I, I guess I watched a little too much. I got to jump. I mean, you know, Burning Man is a participatory uh, organization and I do my best. But sometimes I find I find that my best 
skill is at production and production usually involves helping others achieve their their ends you know and so i have a bunch of ideas that i that i'm interested in but sometimes getting them off the ground is not as easy as i would like you know right now i'm working on some corporate ideas and you know some of the creative ideas i have actually are saying hey work on me instead work on me instead and uh, and those involve you know technology and performance using like um creating like led masks is one of the ones that i've been trying to toy with creating a virtual reality or rather you know rooms so instead of because I, I i look at everybody wearing those vr goggles and i think to myself that is really insulating you know that you put on those goggles and sure you're in a new space but everybody else you know is now doesn't have you as company yeah so i yeah. i've been trying to think of ways perhaps at a festival environment to create a room where you enter the room and it's a virtual reality for all participants in the room so that you can share in the experience and not just have it be a solitary experience. Ooh, you should talk to Dada Ra, Daniel Rosenberg. Okay, He's, please. He actually submitted a proposal to Burning Man for this year to create a virtual reality installation where the bottom floor is a virtual projected space of what's going on in the top floor and uh, that's very similar to what i was proposing yeah, and the the top floor is this is his characteristic mind fuck the top floor is a team of people who never leave the room for the entire week at burning man and then attempt to create a i don't know what you call that like a planar three-dimensional representation of the year's event based on what they're hearing from the people that visit the installation. So they're creating their like imaginary burning man based on what they, what they're hearing visitors tell them. And then the visitors are actually seeing this sort of pseudo telephone version downstairs. That's very similar to what well, I had a concept that was similar, but in which the other room would actually be, uh, have access to a set to set design stuff so that you could make, the virtual space different, but not by using like computer generated graphics, but by literally grabbing items from backstage and bringing them onto the stage of the VR set. So you'd have actual like, you know, do you want a tree? You'd bring out a tree or at least a stage tree and slide it out onto the set and say, hey, look, we're in the desert or, or hey, we're in a, you know, we're in the, we're at an oasis or, or whatever it is you want to accomplish your goal. And you do it with like using theatrical based uh, conventions. So that, you know, because, of course, you could always just virtually render stuff into the VR world if you wanted to change the space of the VR world because you have that luxury. It could be all computer generated if you wanted. Yeah, this thing, though, about it's clear in my mind that we still make a distinction between reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, and that in 30 years, it's just going to be reality that your degree of immersion and through what sensory channels you are immersed is the real distinction here. And that these three categories are, are vaguely, vaguely useless uh, in the sense that like we've been living in an audio only virtual reality since the invention of the Walkman. The real issue that what you just discussed, the issue with the, the visors is you know, a consequence of like a McLuhan-esque medium as message that we're pushing this towards, you know, isolating people. You know, in a weird way, it seems almost part and parcel to the the origins of cybernetics in work like Gregory Bateson's work with the OSS during the Korean War, where he was using cybernetic theory, applying it to sociology to create, to divide and conquer, to, to create what they called schismogenesis at the time and that we're at a point now where it's like we're kind of waking up out of that a little bit as a society and realizing that we actually want to engage with these tools together and that we're not satisfied with this merely being a private television experience or whatever that it's there's got to be a way where this stuff is in our environment that we can em engage it with our whole body that we can engage it collaboratively that it's it has that human factor design where the gestures that we use are natural you know that the machine has to meet us halfway and it seems like we're finally 
understanding that. I mean, do you, do you agree or do you see this heading in a different direction? Well, I mean, by your argument, um, we're, we're already living in a visual virtual reality because I can pull up a YouTube video on my, on my cell phone. And, you know, the moment I'm watching that, I'm in another reality. It's sure it's just a TV screen. It's not immersive, but it's still, I'm, you know, anytime you sit down and watch TV, you're transported in a manner of speaking. I mean, Gibson said that cyberspace is where you are when you're on the phone. So the moment you, you know, take over your senses in some way, shape, shape or form by watching TV, you could argue your reality has shifted. So it's just a matter of of degrees. And, you know, and, and in terms of augmenting ourselves I've, or augmenting reality, our cell phones already augment our reality. We can see all this information that's not real, but it's accessible to us through this device in the palm of our hands. You know, and, and that's that's my argument for why we're already cyborgs. Our cell phones are sure they're external to us, but that's already the information that the future cyborgs will just have either wirelessly accessible or internalized in some way, shape or form. It's the same thing. We've already, you know, we've already started that curve of the singularity, if you will. But I, I think it's really interesting what you, you mentioned about the group effect. And that's what's great about things like an Apple TV that allows you to mirror your screen or the Chromecast, which allows you to send off information to a screen. Because it's very often I'll be, oh, hey, I'm looking at something and then I'll put it up on the screen next to me because I have an Apple TV or a Chromecast, in my case, mostly Chromecast. And so I share what I'm doing with everybody else quickly. And I remember those days where you'd sort of, I mean, it, this this dates back to the first digital cameras when everybody would take a picture and then instantly you'd get people saying, oh, can I see it? Even though it was on a tiny postage stamp screen at the time, everybody wanted to see the image instantaneously because that was the advantage of digital photography was it's available right away. So sharing is definitely a part of the experience of you know the future of our technology. Terrence McKenna talked about the singularity as this strange attractor at the end of time that it's drawing everything into some ineffable constellation. So, I mean, I wonder is like, it seems as though the urge to share more instantaneously at higher levels of resolution and immersiveness is the human self-fulfilling prophecy that draws us ever more tightly into this, this technological media weave with one another, that there's some sort of, you know, it doesn't have to be like a retro causal eschatological kind of a situation where the future is causing this. But at the same time, it does seem like the singularity as a, as a metaphor for this moment where everything has become so interconnected that a new level of individuality emerges from that, like rolls out of bed and takes over the action of the universe is due to the fact that we are so obsessed with sharing our experience, which is, you know, in some perspectives, a kind of a pathological condition where we fail to recognize the ways that we are already unified, that we are already sensitive and in tune with one another. And so we, we get like more and more distracted down these digital rabbit holes that are actually atrophying our innate biological capacities for nonverbal communication of several different kinds. I don't know. I mean, do you, is this the kind of thing that keeps you up at night the way it keeps me up at night? Like thinking of what we, what we lose and, or, or like in general, I know that you're a singularity guy that you're interested in this thing. So I'm, but we've never really had a chance to, to talk about your position with respect to this I don't talk about it much. I just sort of accept it because I watch it happen around me constantly. So I'm not like one of those guys like, hey, the singularity is happening. Oh, my God. I'm like, yeah, of course it's happening. Duh. I mean, can't you see that? Like, it's just so blatantly obvious to me. I don't even need to feel the need to argue it in one way or another. So I, d I definitely find people who are so into it that they like have a fervor. I'm like, I'm like, it's just part of my reality. I accept it as as much as the air I breathe. Um, do I try to? Uh, I mean, you know, let's just say I'm 
more prone to invest in technology than than other things. But at the same time, you know, because I feel like it's not going anywhere. <laughs> technology is not suddenly going to be like, oh, yeah, the Internet is just a fad. I remember when people actually said that once upon a time, you know, it's 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 not going anywhere. But I guess in your own life, you feel relatively well adjusted to make this increasing number of changes. It seems like it seems like if we're to believe the Kurtzwheel hockey stick chart version of this, then in our lifetime, we're going to be living through what was to most human beings a completely unimaginable, like 10, 20,000 years of change. So like, are yeah. you, are you relatively okay with having to confront this totally unprecedented psychological burden or responsibility that seems to face us? I, I guess, cause you know, my, my job is to learn the latest technologies and then teach it to other people, you know? And I, I, so I'm con- my, my job is constantly staying up on, on certain, at least some quadrant of that recent technology. I choose what I think is interesting to me that others that is going to become popular. I learn it usually before others do and then find myself in the position of getting to teach it. That's kind of been what I've been doing ever since I got out of college in one way or another. So fortunately, I enjoy learning and I know that it's never going to end. Like I've already bought a good Google home and automated all the lights and have created custom key phrases. So I, and I'm hoping to go home tonight and be able to tell my Google home to buzz the front door downstairs. I've bought a little, you know, Arduino photon thing from particle IO and I'm, I'm hacking away for the fun of it. And I don't think that's ever going to end for me. And when it does, I, you know, I guess I'll, I will have retired. And my, my only hope is by then there will be enough technological support to make retirement uh, comfortable and easy for me. You know, the biggest fear that people should have is, and this has nothing to do with technology per se, but it's uh, it's more of a economy. Like take a look what happened in, I guess it's almost 10 years ago now with the mortgage crisis. There were all these people that had money in real estate and had borrowed money in order to be there and found that all of a sudden they were having to declare bankruptcies. So I think the biggest fear people have is some sort of upheaval that will change their uh, living style, comfort level, you know, send them to the poorhouse. We, I think, you know, in the last 10 years, we've seen the biggest movement of money from the middle class to the ultra wealthy. And that is definitely the biggest, you know, this is the biggest concern I have about the incoming president is the fact that it's the billionaires that are in charge now. And something tells me they're not going to take too much care of the middle and lower classes, I don't think that's their priority. And so I, I'd say that's probably the biggest concern I have with the upcoming 20,000 years of change is, is that going to be making everybody's lives easier or at least keeping people at the same level of existence? Or is it going to create, oh, well, we don't need these people anymore. They don't serve any purpose because our computers have taken care of uh, all of their job functionalities. And so now we have extraneous people that we don't support or take care of. And, that, and that's actually, I think, a, a bigger concern you know, as, as we move forward. Though, isn't it in some sense easier than ever to choose how we opt in and how we opt out of society and to become these sort of high technology planetary exurban villagers that like it, it seems like you know with seasteading and i guess the flip side of that sort of dark divide and conquer consequence of an internet technology that emphasizes in its current iteration individualized experience is that it seems to be associated with the intensely libertarian mores of some of the internet 1.0 architects and the way that it was the way that it seems to be associated with people who want to print out their own body parts in their garage and invent their own money systems and power their own homes with their own renewable resources and that there's there's hope that people can maybe step sideways out of the shadow of this falling dinosaur that the oppression that we're rightfully concerned about 
in, in this deepening chasm between the rich and poor that you know maybe we can just kind of live in our own our own world and like not mess with each other but it just, that also seems kind of naive well i'm not saying it's impossible but there's going to be huge growing pains getting from here to there you know some people will be educated and understand the concepts that you just spoke of well enough to see it as it happens but there's also going to be a lot of people that won't adjust i think there was some statistic about how when television first came out that the number of people that had psychological issues skyrocketed that some people couldn't deal with you know the remote transmission of information and the fact that now we were hearing what was going on all around the world that people weren't built at the time to deal with a more global world they had their own insular world and suddenly the tv coming into their home was telling them what was going on from afar and it drove them nuts and I think that's, you know, perhaps radio did that first. And I think there's a certain truth that as you add more information overload, you're now making a requirement on people to keep up. And there are a lot of people in this society that learn, have learned how to tune out. Oh, I don't read the news. I, I don't pay attention to what's going on. It's all too confusing. It's too much. Oh, there's some new technology that allow me to take care of myself. No, I'm relying on my welfare check or I'm relying on my, my simple job. Oh, I've lost my simple job. I have absolutely no idea what to do. So I, I don't think you're wrong. I think there will be a time in the future where there will be a greater amount of self-sufficiency that's not at the you know, centralized government level and that people will be able to live their own, you know, their own lifestyle and their own world. But between here and there, there's some chasm in between and people are going to fall into that chasm. So what do you advise for people? I mean, clearly what seems to be working for you and what seems as a general prophylactic for getting overwhelmed and kind of kicked aside by all of this change is to embrace and love learning. Yes. Kevin Kelly in, in his latest book, The Inevitable, says, get ready to be a noob for the rest of your life. Right. And learn to love being a noob because it's, yeah. you're never going to get, you're never going to catch up from this moment forward. You will never catch up. So, I mean, other than that, I mean, do you have any insight into like what people can do? The, the only be, other thing I was going to mention was community. You know, that's, you know, community and education, you know, and I think one of the biggest problems with, you know, the American system in general is that it doesn't emphasize education because people would be able to better take care of themselves if education was a higher priority. And we've made education more expensive. You know, there's a, there's a friend of mine that espouses how you don't really need a college degree anymore, that you can actually, if you have, I guess, the wherewithal, you could, you could potentially educate yourself online, but there's, I don't think people yet have really learned to do that. You know, I'm someone that can read the manual or read the docs. I'm one of those people, but not everybody is. So for those that aren't, they still need a community of people to teach. You know, I run uh, a meetup. I do a conference series, you know, in my professional life. I, I guess here's where I'm supposed to do a plug. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, OK, so I guess I've been running the Angular NYC meetup, which, you know, talks about the Angular web framework in New York for almost five years now. Uh, I'm doing a JavaScript conference, I guess, in a couple of weeks called BuzzJS. And, you know, I, and I'm going to be teaching a full day workshop the day before on on Angular. And this this is kind of what I do. And so the meetup has always been free. The one day conference on JavaScript is 70 bucks, which in New York City in Times Square is really inexpensive for a conference. That's like a sandwich. Um, yeah. <laughs> so and, and we actually provide food. So you will get a sandwich for that seventy dollars. <laughs> So I'm, I'm just saying like that there are things that I, I try to do. And, and at the same time, you know, I'm I also volunteer my time for a lot of creative endeavors, you know, Burning Man related endeavors that are a little bit more. Let's just say some of the festival, we, you know, the transformational festival circuit has to do with, hey, there's sure there's great music and there's great, you know, there's interactive art. But there's also talks that are supposed to educate you and make you realize that, you know, by participating, you know, you have a lot to offer yourself and that others are trying to offer something to you and that this community has a value above and beyond just, you know, partying. 
And I think that's that's something that definitely happens in the community that I'm a part of. So I, I really respect that as well. Yeah, it seems like the most important thing right now, the thing that's animated me in the last few years as I've shifted from my own innate bias, like you said, you know, being a watcher rather than a doer, being really mostly interested. Well, I'm a supporter. I don't just watch. I support a lot of other people. But sometimes you're like, wait, I've got the idea. I've got to do my idea, not somebody else's. Mm. For me, it was a shift from sort of taking this scholastic learning distance, you know, regarding everything as an alien anthropologist or a student, and then recognizing that the best way to learn is through this whole body interaction. And then in that, the increasing urgency of all of these things that we've discussed has inspired in me a sense of the, the importance of recruiting people into that same enthusiastic embodied learning process to like actually get in there and teach people remedially because this is not something that was taught in school when I was going through school and and most people still it's not taught this way but teaching people how to enjoy being a part of it rather than simply leaning back on the comfortable and familiar thing which is to be frankly completely disempowered and, and disenfranchised and told that it's not our responsibility or even our capacity to handle these things that are now, because we are all flooded with signals from all over the world and other people's problems are our problems. And we live in this state uh, of constant anxiety over things that we have no control over, but maybe we do. Maybe we actually do have some, not control, but some way of influencing things. And it seems like that's you only need homeopathic levels of influence to restore someone's sense of vitality and purpose in life, you know? Yeah, I've often thought that if you really knew what you were doing, you could exert the small, you know, it's the chaos theory, you could exert the smallest amount of effort and cause the maximum amount of change if you just knew exactly where to push. So sure, small amounts add up over time. Certainly, you, you know, you talk about how a drop of water can create a chasm. But if you exert the right force in the right area, you, you know, I have a friend, he's always trying to get other people to on board, but he's not necessarily the, the most engaged. You know, for instance, when Bernie Sanders was running, he was really pro Bernie Sanders. and He kept trying to convince others to get more involved with the campaign. But it wasn't like he got more involved in the campaign. He thought his best way of exerting his efforts was to just convince others who, he, you know, perhaps he thought they had uh, more to say or could exert more more effect. And that his, you know, was more of a domino theory. If I can make a slightly larger domino than me have an effect, then then I've had enough of an effect. Mm. But you don't seem. You sound like you don't believe that that worked. Oh no, I, it works if you push in the right direction. It definitely works. So we're coming up on an hour here, and I want to make sure that, one, we give you time to voice everything that you want to voice to the unborn multitudes of inevitable digital archaeologists that will hopefully find this, (laughs) this, you know, buried in a server on Mars or wherever it ends up. But also, in you know, there's, there's this other question that I love to ask people who come onto the show, which is about your your relationship to the future beyond the span of your own life. It was like the best articulation that I've seen for the best argument that I've seen for the, or the vision, I should say, that I've seen for the future of the internet is that this could be for the human species, a kind of planet scale cathedral building project, you know, that we've, we've sort of lost sight of how our lives are embedded within a great work, capital G W, that will not be fulfilled within the course of our lifetimes. And that, you know, perhaps by turning our attention to something like the project of, in my case, it would be like the interspecies internet and making sure that when this finally grows beyond the bounds of humankind, that, that we don't accidentally cause horrible evil. In, in the way that we foolishly onboard other species into this digital ecosystem. And so this is the thing that 
you know, that motivates me is the sense of participation in trying to steer this in the healthiest and most creative and beautiful way possible. It's something that, you know, Jaron Lanier has, has spoken about uh, extensively. It was the, the theme of his keynote at Moogfest last year. So I don't know, like, what, is, what do you see beyond the horizon of your own life? And like, what questions or what messages do you have for the people living over that horizon? Well, you know, I, maybe it sounds, sounds really hokey, but obviously, you know, in terms of education, you know, teach your children well, there, there's, there's job one. So, and, you know, beyond my life, if I was to have children, that would be something I would hope to do is make sure that they were well educated and would carry on uh, a legacy of conceptual thought that would lead in the right direction. And then if we have artificial intelligences, then you're going to be seeing the same debates that we're having. Those artificial intelligences are going to have, <laughs> you know, and that's that's crazy to think. But it's certainly possible. You know, at what point will we have some Twitter bot that's actually influencing people as much as Donald Trump? Oof. That's uh doesn't even have to pass the Turing test, just a Twitter bot. So do you, is there something that you wish that you could live to see that you wonder if you'll live to see? Yeah, I'd like to see, I'd like to see AI pass the Turing test. And I, and I you know, I, I think I will. Maybe you just did. <laughs> what do you mean? Is that really you? Well, I am the, I, I managed to make it through an entire episode about Westworld on this show without right. ever joking about how I'm the host of this podcast. So, right. But I'm bummed. Well, you just, but you just did it now. <laughs> there we go. Got it on there. Yeah. No, um, I mean, what would I really hope to see? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see, I don't know, maybe it's hokey again, but I'd like to see people at least have the bare necessities that when people complain, they, it's the luxury of complaining about something that's not their their health. Do you know what I mean? Right now, we, we live in a world where people have to fight just to get health care. And I have to say, I, I, you know, as someone who's seen Obamacare, I don't think it was the solution. And I think it's great that more people have it, but it's definitely not the greatest thing in the world. Not that I want to see it repealed with nothing, which is, I think, what Trump's plan so far is. But um, you know, I, I believe in the more European or Canadian systems where healthcare is a little bit more uh, evenly distributed. I think I'd like to see that. I'd like to see that in this country if I stay in this country, mm. well, <laughs> which you know, I don't care, which I don't guarantee. Yeah. You know, I, I, I do say that, uh, you know, that would be comforting. Mm. You know, there's, there's I just have this feeling that the haves and the have nots is a really scary situation. And it can't last long before the oppressed try to rise up and they're either slaughtered or succeed. It's, it's funny that you say that because I actually read an, uh, the keynote by Linda Rothschild at Davos last year or the year before was about the importance of <laughs> loosening the collar a little bit. Because you're saying like this, this economy isn't going to work for us, the 0.001% unless people can actually spend money. And if they don't have right. money, they can't spend it. So it was this, this super surreal moment for me or a counter expectations moment where you're hearing from the despised global elitist that, oh, wait, no, we, we actually might want to consider a universal basic income just to keep people in the game. And it seems like, you know, I, I hold out hope that it's the desire to keep everyone in the game. Right. That ends up winning this for the human species. The flip side of that, though, is to talk about, you know, consumerism in general is I, I also hope we manage to figure out how to make things a little bit more, you know, environmentally friendly at the same time, because our whole economy is based on, you know, buying things. And, you know, if we have to dispose of those things that we buy or if they are disposable and they're not, you know, environmentally friendly, then we're just going to we're going to kill us, uh, ourselves slow, slower is all. Yeah. You know, but I've seen a lot of efforts towards um, carbon neutrality in certain places. And, you know, I, I sometimes I go to eat and I, you know, and I don't know what the carbon footprint is of these places, but they have compostable 
you know, disposable, compostable forks and knives and bowls and everything is the place is designed not to have to clean anything. But at the same time, everything that they give out will compost. Yeah. yeah. Couldn't we maybe upgrade it from Burning Man to Composting Man? Hmm. You know, that's like the main problem that people seem to have with that event is that it's just this, even as an exercise in ephemerality, it's still just this egregious, completely decadent display of wastefulness. All of the wood that's burned rather than used to grow reishi mushrooms or turkey tail or whatever, you know, that I think we're going to have to disabuse ourselves of this sort of linear apocalyptic mindset before we can take on the kind of steady state, mature ecosystem recycling society that we're going to need in order to, to keep playing this game, to keep up with the novelty. Like, you know, if it's like, get this thing, it's like every day you've got a new t-shirt design that you want to buy. Well, it's like, well, the only way to keep that up is if you recycle yesterday's clothing into the printer right. and it prints out your, your daily fashion subscription or whatever. And, you know, and part of it is also a trickle down concept of, oh, well, I'm done with my T-shirt. I'll donate it to somebody else. I mean, it, it, just to so I'll talk about Burning Man in just a second. But the concept of of like buying and disposing of like. So, for instance, a buddy of mine bought the latest in OLED TVs for two thousand dollars. But my logic is I'll buy a TV for five hundred dollars. And if I really want an OLED in two years, that same TV that he spent $2,000 on will be $500, you know, but then I have the waste of I've bought two TVs over two years, and he's only bought one, of course, I've spent half the money. So you know, the, the economy favors my decision. Uh, but at the same time, I now have an extra TV to give away to somebody else, if I can, or to even sell if I, I could. So I find that whole environmental world a little weird. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very much like the example that I heard where they said that an automobile accident is better for the economy than no automobile accident. Because, there's, you know, the, the ambulance worker is the guy that has to repair the stoplight you crashed into. This whole system that comes awake, comes alive in order to support this thing. And that it, because of this, because we've we've skewed the system to favor this pathological state rather than skewing the system to favor refabbing houses rather than building new ones right you know that this this process of repair and reuse and recycle isn't yet really recognized or visible by the economy in the way that it has to be if we're going to not blow ourselves up so going back to burning man yeah. if we had if we all had electric cars and if by some miracle, we have renewable energy for our planes as well, then perhaps getting to and from Burning Man wouldn't be ridiculously carbon intensive. And then if we actually brought reusable, you know, I mean, I've, there are people at Burning Man working really hard at creating reusable structures, you know, hopefully not made out of, you know, plastic that won't de biodegrade ever, but, um, you know, something that you can take apart and reuse. And there are a lot of concepts out there that involve using a material to create a structure and then being able to reuse that material to create a different structure once you're no longer interested in that first structure. And I, I definitely applaud those types of efforts. And there's there's been a number, some that use rock and granite, some that use, you know, building blocks of other types. Uh, and I find that stuff really interesting. And hopefully we'll reach that stage soon. And, you know, and if not, that's something I'd like to see in the future, where the way we live our lives doesn't impact the environment in such a way that we are killing the planet. Well, it seems like a, a reasonably complete conversation at this point. Anything else that you want to leave on the record, the, the quote unquote permanent record? And the permanent record. Yeah, right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael, for, for having me on your show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Everybody, Daniel Zen. A very eclectic and interesting person. If you live in New York, make it out or nearby. Make it out to Gratitude NYC, one of the, the great events that he helps throws. I don't know, man. I'm just glad to know you and uh, have had the opportunity to have you on the show. Thanks, Michael. 
Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Be sure to subscribe to Future Fossils and leave us a review. It really helps us get these conversations into the ears of other people who will appreciate and benefit from them. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do that at patreon.com forward slash Michael Garfield. Be good to yourselves and have a beautiful century. And we may not ever figure out.